it's not uncommon to find some form of a structure in the heart that you think does not belong there. Either it could be a true tumor, a mass, maybe it's an artifact, or maybe it's a structure that should actually belong there and that you just misinterpret as some form of a tumor. These are exactly the topics that we will deal with in this chapter. So let's start with pseudotumors, structures which are in the heart and belong to the heart and are not really a pathology. We have to know what structures we can find. And let us start with the right atrium. I think you've all heard about the eustachian valve and we've seen examples in the previous chapters. And this is such a beautiful example. It's located right here where the inferior vena cava enters the right atrium. And these structures can be quite long at times. Here's a more detailed view showing you the mobility of such a eustachian valve. Now, what is the eustachian valve? It's a structure which is located, as I already mentioned, at the entry site of the inferior vena cava, and it has a purpose. The purpose of the eustachian valve is to direct the blood during the fetal circulation towards the patent foramen ovale. So it directs the oxygenated blood to the left atrium. The eustachian valve can nicely be visualized also with transesophageal echocardiography. Here is an example again, a very long structure, a prominent eustachian valve, as we would call it, right close to where the inferior vena cava enters the heart. And here you can appreciate that the blood is obviously directed right towards the patent foramen ovale in this case. Now, which other views can you see the eustachian valve, the four chamber view? As I mentioned previously, this is another example. Very long eustachian valve right here, but also in a subcoastal view, because that's where you see the inferior vena cava. And since the eustachian valve is located there, it's also nice to use this view to display the eustachian valve. The size of the eustachian valve can vary greatly. Sometimes it's very small. In other situations, as in this case here, it's quite large. Sometimes it's quite difficult to differentiate the eustachian valve from a so-called rete chiari or chiari network. We'll talk about that pathology later. Here's an example where it's very difficult to say what really is going on here. Is this maybe the network I talked about, the rete network? Maybe it is just a very prominent and bizarrely shaped eustachian valve, or maybe there's even something on the eustachian valve. This is certainly a possibility because we know that we can find endocarditis on the eustachian valve as well. Remember, endocarditis just means that the infection is somewhere on the endocardium, and the eustachian valve truly also has endocardium, so you can find it there as well. Here is the structure that I talked about. You see it's a very long mobile structure attached right on the eustachian valve. The patient had infection, so we were pretty convinced that this was his problem. Another example, a patient that was brought to a lab because a tumor was suspected, what we found here was this. Now, to be honest, it's very difficult to say if it's just a normal eustachian valve or if there's something on the valve. The patient didn't have any fever. We followed the patient for several months and nothing changed. So I would say it's just a, I would say a variant of a more prominent eustachian valve. Now let's turn to the Chiari network. What is the Chiari network? Well, those are embryologic remnants of the sinus venosus. You will find them in approximately, I'd say, 1 to 3% of patients. Still, I believe that we're almost over-diagnosing it and that many of the so-called Chiari networks were diagnosed are actually just prominent eustachian valves, but that's just my personal feeling. In any case, this would be such an example. You have a lot of echoes here in the right atrium. It's a network that expands the entire right atrium or only parts of the right atrium. And it's a pathology, or it's not even a pathology. It's a, a finding that does not have any clinical importance at all. Here is an example, a specimen of such a Chiari network. You see the network is here located in this region. And if you perform echocardiography, you have all these orthogonal cuts of this network, which sometimes appears if there's a contrast in the right atrium. The next structure of the heart that frequently leads to the misdiagnosis of a tumor is the crista terminalis. What is it? Well, it's a ridge that actually expands from the superior to the inferior aspect of the right atrium, kind of separating the right atrium from the right atrial appendage. I will show you here on the model what I mean. 
The crista terminalis is the red structure right here. It's a ridge. Now let's take a look at the crista terminalis from inside the heart. Here is a video where we see the right atrial appendage here. You see the strong trabeculations. You also see how thin-walled the right atrial wall is. And this is the crista terminalis, which is a smooth structure, which kind of is in close proximity to the right atrial appendage. So now we've seen how it looks on an anatomical specimen, and we've seen how it looks on the model, but how does it look on the echocardiogram? Here are two examples. On the left-hand side, you see the crista terminalis right here. It's a kind of a nodule that can be, at times, relatively prominent. If you play around with a tilt from a four-chamber view, you can almost always visualize the crista terminalis. Here's another example. And as I mentioned, it can be, at times, quite large, and then it could lead to the misdiagnosis of some form of a tumor. This could be such a case where you might think that the crista terminalis, located right here, is a tumor, a focused view of the right atrium in a four-chamber view. It's quite easy to actually see the crista terminalis from a transesophageal approach because it appears as if it's an extension of the superior vena cava. You see it right here. This would be the crista terminalis. And it is very close to the right atrial appendage, which is located right here. And here is the last pseudotumor of the right atrium fatty infiltration or a prominent tricuspid valve annulus. We see that there is a kind of a triangular shaped structure right here at the base of the tricuspid leaflet. And this is not a tumor because usually we have a lot of fatty tissue, both in the annulus itself and also in the groove, in the so-called AV groove, which appears as if a tumor in some patients. So don't mistake in that for a tumor as well. An example again, Here's a patient with such a very prominent tricuspid valve annulus. And we've seen many patients come with a diagnosis of a tumor, but it was just a prominent tricuspid valve annulus. Good, so now let's take a look at the other atrium, the left atrium. Lipomatous intraatrial septum. If you perform TE, I'm sure you've seen it on several occasions. It is a structure where you have fatty infiltration of the secundum septum, where the primum septum is actually free of fatty infiltration. And that's why the structure looks something like a dumbbell. You can also see a lipomatous intraatrial septum from a transthoracic approach, but you have to search for it and you have to look exactly towards the intraatrial septum in the views where you see the IAS nicely. And that is the subcoastal view. Here is such a subcoastal view where you can appreciate that there is a very thick secundum septum, and this narrow part here is the primum septum. Again, a dumbbell shape. Just a little bit of a different orientation, the same patient. This would be a lipomatous intraatrial septum. It's not a pathology. It, however, is associated more frequently with obese patients and with atrial fibrillation. But it does not predispose to a tumor, and it is nothing to worry about. The next pathology is the so-called mitral annual calcification, which you will see very frequently, especially in elderly patients. The typical characteristics here are that you have echogenic structures, especially located in the posterior rim of the mitral valve. You see that nicely here that the entire posterior rim of the mitral annulus is calcified. And that is kind of a little bit of a, I would say, differential diagnosis to true tumors, which can also be located at the annulus of the mitral valve. You would have shadowing behind this calcification, and the degree of calcification can vary greatly. Especially if your patients get older, you will have infiltration of this calcification also into the myocardium. So you can see that parts of it reach into the myocardium as well. We'll talk about a specific form of mitral annual calcification in a later section of this chapter. But now let's turn to a pathology that is actually more easy to see in a transesophageal echo, as you will see later. It is the so-called limbus. What is the limbus? It's a ridge that separates the left atrial appendage, which is right here. You have a thrombus here inside. With the left upper pulmonary vein, which is located right here. So this ridge here sometimes looks like a tumor, and it can 
be very prominent at times. You can see it in a view where you have, I would say, a two-chamber view or a view somewhere in between a four and a two-chamber view. So don't mistake that for a tumor as well. Here is a transesophageal study that shows you the ridge. Here is the left upper pulmonic vein. This is the ridge, and this is a thrombus. Let's see how the limbus looks from inside the heart. This is the left atrial appendage, the trabeculations you see here, and this here is the limbus. Right here would be the left upper pulmonic vein. Looking at the right ventricle, there are two structures that could lead to the false diagnosis of a tumor. The first are trabeculations. You all know that the right ventricle is much more trabeculated than the left especially if you have right ventricle hypertrophy. Here are these trabeculations that I just talked about. And here is a video that shows you the papillary muscle of the right ventricle. Now, the papillary muscles of the right ventricle are usually not so well grouped as those of the left. You have them dispersed throughout uh, the, I would say, lateral and anterior wall of the right ventricle. And you see that those trabeculations, especially if you hit them orthogonally, sometimes can appear as if they are a tumor. The second structure that you could mistaken for a tumor is the moderator band. It's this structure here that spans from the lateral wall to the septum. The moderator band can be sometimes very prominent. And the function of the moderator band is not quite clear. Some people say that it is important so that it prevents excessive expansion of the right ventricle. But it also has fibers which conduct. So it might also be important for the conduction system. In any case, the moderator band is a very important structure because it helps us to differentiate the left from the right ventricle. This might not be necessary in this case, but if you have congenital abnormalities, it is sometimes a very great help to see the moderator band. Again, a video that shows the moderator band from the inside. One can see the moderator band right here. It's this shiny structure that spans through the right ventricle. In the left ventricle, we can find the following pseudotumors. First, aberrant cords. Those are cords that kind of span the ventricle. You see two of them right here, very thin, one here and one here. Again, not a pathology, but a, I would say, very frequent finding. You can see them very frequently in patients who have a dilated left ventricle because then they really expand and you can see them nicely. And in patients who have hypertrophy because there you see more trapegulations in general. The second pseudotumor is the so-called elongated cord. Those are cords which insert normally into the mitral valve, but for some reason or other are rather long. And therefore they have a whip-like motion and they can actually have a motion very similar to that of the mitral valve in SAM, in systolic anterior motion. And that's why we call this a chordal SAM. Now this does not cause obstruction at all, but at times it leads to the misdiagnosis of a tumor, of a vegetation for example. Here's another example. Look closely and you will see that we have again a whip-like motion of this cord which touches the interventricular septum right here. You can also see it in the four-chamber view right up here. So elongated cords, a very frequent finding, a pseudotumor, no true pathology. I already talked about trabeculations of the right ventricle and you can sometimes also see them in the left ventricle. Here's such an example, strongly trabeculated myocardium, again frequently seen in hypertrophy, frequently seen in patients who have hypertrophy and then dilate, but also, and this is the main issue, it can also be present in patients who have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or what we call non-compaction syndrome. And this is one of the major differential diagnoses that we have to make in such a situation. Here an example where, to be honest, I don't know what the true answer is. You see very prominent trabecula here. Is this just a prominent trabeculation? or is it already some form of non-compaction? In any case, this is not a tumor, this is myocardium. 
And if you're not sure, inject contrast. That can give you additional information whether or not it is a tumor or if it is myocardium. And finally, one more pseudotumor, the abnormal positioned papillary muscle. In this case, it is positioned very far in the apex. But remember this image because tumors can look very similar to this. And if we see something like this, to be honest, sometimes we're not sure either. The next set of pseudotumors I'm going to show you are not native structures, but actually artificial structures that we implant for one reason or another into the heart. The first is the most common, the pacemaker lead. One can appreciate that the patient has a pacemaker lead here in the right ventricle. And you can also see parts of it here in the right atrium, and there seems to be a second pacemaker lead in the right atrium as well. So pacemaker leads appear as echogenic structures, which can produce a number of artifacts. Here's another example. This time we're focusing towards the tip of the pacemaker, and we see the tip right here. As a matter of fact, this is a patient where we had the suspicion that the pacemaker lead was actually perforating the heart. But again, you see one lead here. There seems to be another lead right here and maybe a number of different leads here. So some patients actually have four, five, or six, or even more pacemaker leads sometimes in place, and that can present the problem, especially removing them. But for us in this chapter, it's just important that you do not mix them up with a tumor. But beware, sometimes you can have structures on the pacemaker leads as well. Here's another example of a pacemaker lead, where you nicely see the artifacts which are produced by this pacemaker down here. And here is a patient who has a pacemaker loop. If you look at the structure at first glance, you might have the impression that this is a cystic structure here. But in reality, if you turn and twist the transducer a little bit, you will see that actually the pacemaker comes in through here and then circles the right atrium and then here goes into the right ventricle. So a pacemaker loop. The next artificial structure we can see is the so-called amplatz occlude or occluders in general. Those are occluders that we position into the body of the patient to close, for example, an atrial septal defect or a patent foramen ovale. And most of these occluders have two discs. You can see one disc here and the other disc here. So one is on the left atrial side, and the other one is on the right atrial side. It's easy to appreciate the occluder also in a four-chamber view. So this is not a tumor. This is a normal structure that we implanted into the heart. And finally, patients who have a central line, especially if it's placed too deep into the heart, can also sometimes present as if they have a pseudotumor. Here is an example of this central line, which is almost touching the tricuspid valve, or at least it's very far inside the right atrium. So be aware that especially dialysis patients have central lines and dialysis catheters that you might be able to see with echocardiography. And finally, this is a so-called mitra clip. What is the mitra clip? It's a special clip that we implant into patients who have severe mitral regurgitation and who are no surgical candidates. In this case, we cinch together the anterior and the posterior leaflet and create kind of a double orifice. You see right here and here is the second orifice, right here. And in between, we have this echogenic clip. It's a metallic clip, and therefore, you also have artifacts. When you look at these clips in a four-chamber view, you have the impression as if the mitral valve is not opening at all, at least not in the region where the clip is. So, another foreign body that you might be able to visualize on echocardiography. And the last example, again, a pacemaker, but this time a special form of pacemaker, a pacemaker where we have one lead implanted into the coronary sinus. Right here is the lead. This is a so-called CRT pacemaker or a tri-lead pacemaker where one lead is in the right ventricle. You can see that right here. One is in the right atrium and the third is in the coronary sinus. A pacemaker which is used in patients who have left bundle branch block to cause resynchronization, CRT therapy.
Next on our list are artifacts. Now, I'm not going to dwell too much on the issue of artifacts because we covered them in the very first chapter on technical principles. But I just want to show you some situations where you might run into the problem of having an artifact that you think is a tumor. And that is basically always if you have poor image quality. Now, the main trick that I can give you here is always use multiple views. And if you see something that looks like a tumor, you should actually also see it in other views as well. One very common situation are the so-called near-field artifacts. This is what you see right here at the apex that I would say looks maybe like a tumor, which in reality is not. It's just an artifact that you find in the near-field. What you do in such a situation is you try to, of course, optimize the focus to this region and then again look at orthogonal views and use contrast. This is the method of choice to exclude a tumor, especially in this region. Another potential source of a tumor is if you image structures tangentially. Here would be such an example. This is the tricuspid annulus. And if you cut through it without displaying the true tricuspid valve, it appears very prominent. You might think there's a tumor. Again, what you would do is you try to optimize your view and look at several views because if you correct then the tumor or the structure should actually vanish. So this concludes this section on pseudotumors. You haven't seen any true tumors yet. In the next chapter, you will.